Good evening. Good evening. Merry, Christmas. Merry Christmas. You're going to do this all night. It's going to be a long night. <laughs> Welcome to the Heartland United Methodist Church Sanctuary. Whether you're here in person or tuning in at home, we really appreciate you being a part of tonight's special Christmas Eve worship service. We've gathered to celebrate for the word of God came to earth and lived among us. Let's pray. Lord, we are blessed to know your glory. We have come to worship and praise you for who you are and all you have done. For Jesus Christ, you are the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, through whom all things were created and who holds everything together. And you revealed yourself to us in signs and wonders, in the manger, in your teachings, in your miracles and healings, on the cross, through the resurrection, and gifting us with your Holy Spirit. As we reflect on these things tonight, may our hearts be moved as we worship. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's begin by celebrating his coming to us by standing, if you're comfortable to stand, and joyfully sing, Joy to the World. nature, God, in his great love for us, he left his throne and kingly crown. He came, in great humility, from God's heaven to a manger. The word of the Father became Mary's little son. He came to earth for us, emptying himself of all riches but love, seeking to save. Leaving the lush halls of heaven to the rough and rugged cross, and his love reached all the way to where we are to set people free from sin and darkness. He finds us with his limitless, redeeming love and makes peace between God and ourselves and the potential for us to live in peace with each other. Therefore, God lifted him from the grave to the highest place of honor so that every person will recognize his holy name and honor him as our Savior and Lord. And yet we still live in a world where Jesus is often shut out. No room is created in the important places of our world or in the hearts of humanity. He's still relegated to stables and feeding troughs, often acknowledged only on holy days and even then only on the outer fringes of our life. But for we who make room for him and invite him to come to our hearts and acknowledge that he is Lord to the glory of the Father, and then we pray that as he continues to come to us, that the leaders of home to the leaders of the world will recognize and follow his wisdom and bring order to a world that is often chaotic and dysfunctional. So let's sing that prayer as we prepare for the Advent candles. O come, O come, Emmanuel, just the refrain. It's right on the screen for you. O come, thou wisdom from on high, and order all things far and nigh. To us the path of knowledge show. Us in her ways to go. 
God of hope, we look around at our world, we see all that is wrong and wonder where you are. We are a broken people, unable to work together for our common good. Yet you, your glance brings a glimmer that something better is coming. You call us to seek your deliverance. We look for the light of your redemption. People proclaim that our hope is in God's comfort and healing. Our hope is in God's comfort and healing. Say the yellow parts with Sarah in the future. Oops, hang on. Therefore, we light the candle of hope. Prince of Peace, we look around at our world, we see differences and become defensive. We build dividing walls of protection and fight to conquer others into conformity. Yet you have woven variety into the warp and woof of your creation's tapestry. You call us to love and be at peace with all that we meet. People proclaim that our peace is in God's forgiving grace. Our peace is in God's forgiving grace. Therefore, we light the candle of peace. Spirit of joy, we look around at our world and we feel the frustration of an empty, barren wilderness. We sorrow and despair over the darkening in the depths of many souls. Yet you break through the clouds and shower your blessings on society's dryness. You call us to be cleaned up and dressed up to burst into beautiful bloom. People proclaim that our joy is complete in God's love. Our joy is complete in God's love. Therefore, we light the candle of joy. God of love, we look around at our world. We see distractions and distortions from what could be. We search high and low and everywhere but to the one who has come and returned to heaven. Yet you continue to make your home with us and make a home for us. You call us to open the doors of our hearts to you, to each other, and to the world. People proclaim that our love flows from God's reaching, uniting harmony. Our love flows from God's reaching, uniting harmony. Therefore, we light the candle of love. Heavenly Father, we look around at our world. We see chaos and confusion. We are filled with questions for which we have no answers. Different opinions are met with angry intolerance. Yet you guide gently and teach truthfully, revealing yourself through your son. You call us to follow him, not in abstract principle, but in the principled practice of life as Christ lived and lives with us. People proclaim that Christ is with us. Christ is with us. Therefore, we light the Christ candle. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel has come to thee, O that God has done for us in Christ and receiving him in our heart and life and priority. We are encouraged and comforted. We participate in his spirit and his love. We feel his tenderness and compassion. If this is so, then we are called to have the same mind of Christ, the same valuing of others, the same self-giving love, the same willingness to sacrifice for the betterment of the relationships with each other and throughout the world. So let's give a thankful response to all he has done for us. Ushers.
God of mercy, you have come looking for an invitation to dwell. Inspire our hearts to hospitality that welcomes all your children in your name. And may these offerings be used to that end. In Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. You may be seated. A journalist was excited about an opportunity to work in international development by spending time in the African desert. She imagined living in a small personal hut with a palm tree to the side, inside a little desk surrounded by mosquito netting where she could write and work. It's a version of a romanticized ideal for many people to make a significant impact on our world without actually ever engaging with it face to face. When she arrived at her destination, no housing had been arranged. They showed her a room with a view. The walls reached to about this high. It meant lots of exposure, lots of community, and lots of opportunities to connect. For two years, she shared her group home with more than 30 children, four freedom fighters, a government bureaucrat, a wife beater, a Red Cross worker with a taste for alcohol a number of prostitutes, a madman, and all the customers of the tea shop next door. In this community, united by half walls, there is no room for pretense, for false appearances, for deceptions, or for self-serving fantasies and dreams. There's no opportunity to vent and scream to the heavens, no possibility of being charming in public and nasty in private, because everything was public. Every private outburst was a matter of public record. And this reporter discovered that she was not as altruistically, lovingly connected to her world as she had assumed that she was. It's a wake-up call. Such awareness can be painful, but important to growth. Historically, we most often hear that it is in the vast silence of solitude in the desert that allowed mystics to contemplate the mysteries of life and confront the chaos of their hearts. But our journalists discovered that sometimes we learn as much about God and ourselves and our world when we are forced away from quiet isolation and into the chaos of a life that is never alone. Be it in the stillness or in the chaos, she needed to hear, and we need to hear it again, the message of Christ's birth and life and what that means for us today. Listen to Donna and Kathy as they play. Do you hear what I hear?
You remember the lyrics of that song? The wind asked the lamb to see the star. The lamb asked the shepherd boy to hear the angel's song in the sky. The shepherd boy asked the king to know that there is a shivering baby to whom we need to bring gifts. And the king told the people everywhere to pray for peace, for the child would bring goodness and light. Of course, the king in the song was a more noble king than the one who was in charge of Jerusalem area and Bethlehem when Jesus was born. He had no room for a new baby who would grow up to rule his life and turn his known world upside down. The question is, do we? Or like we heard Herod say last week for who, who, in the pageant that we had, do we say the words of desiring worship but have a different agenda at work? I believe most of us sincerely do desire and intend to worship or we wouldn't be here tonight or tuning in online to see this. You're like the town of Bethlehem, the duties and events and obligations of life get in the way of our noble desires and intentions and we discover we don't have the space to give room in our busy lives, in our divided hearts for the Christ child. There's an old tale about a peasant and his wife who lived in a tiny cottage. It was so tiny there was no room to have guests or to raise a family. Even with just the two of them, they were constantly hovering in each other's paths and stepping on each other's last nerve. (laughs) They needed a bigger house. Well, as luck and fairy tales would have it, a wizard arrived to grant them their desires. He said, you shall have a bigger house if you do as I tell you. First, you must bring in all your chickens and ducks and geese and fowl into the house with you. Next, bring in the dogs and the cats and the pigs and the cows and the horses and the goat. The peasant and his wife pushed and shoved and they finally squeezed them all in tight. Then the wizard demanded they put on a feast and invite their neighbors and their animals to come as well. If you do this, he said, by tonight you will have a bigger house. It didn't seem possible that they could fit them all into the already overstuffed cottage, but the invitations were sent and the banquet began and it was noisy and it was crowded and people couldn't hardly move, but it was a festive time. Eventually, every neighbor, beast, fish, and fowl that had been welcomed were fed and went home. And when it was over, the peasant and his wife collapsed in happy exhaustion and put up their feet to rest. And it was then they realized how spacious their house was. (laughs) And they decided they could start a family after all. Maybe our life and priorities feel really crowded and we don't know how we're going to fit God in on this day or that day. Could it be we squeeze all of those other things in order to keep God out? Invite God in anyway. It'll be surprising how much extra room he can help us create. Sometimes it isn't the space for multiple things. It's the time to get things done. Years ago, an experiment attempted to measure how time pressures enable or hinder us from being the kind of people we want to be. The professor recruited 15 individuals. They met at 2 p.m., They handed out instructions in sealed envelopes. The first five were called the high hurry group. The group did not hear this label of them. All all they got was the instructions in the envelope. This high hurry group was instructed to proceed across campus to a certain place without delay. They had 15 minutes to reach their destination or their grade would be docked. The second five were given medium hurry instructions. They were given 45 minutes to make their way across the campus. The last five were given the low hurry group. They had till five o'clock. They had three hours to meander across campus and get to where they needed to be. Meanwhile, the professor had arranged for drama majors to be on the path. One sat with his head in his hands, crying and wailing in a way that nobody could not notice that. And another was laying face down as if he had had some kind of seizure and was unconscious. At some point, all 15 of those volunteers had to make their way past these obviously needy persons to reach their destination. No one in the high hurry group stopped to help. 
Two in the medium hurry group stopped. All five in the low hurry group made attempts to help. We live in a culture that praises being too busy to turn around. Could it be that some of that is an unconscious effort to chase our own agenda and avoid having to self-sacrificially serve someone else's needy agenda because we don't have time? And in the New Testament story, it is even stopping to help someone who belonged in the category of not one of us, but of the them undeserving others category, quote unquote. And that Samaritan did all for the sake of bringing, it a, bringing a bit more peace and healing and wholeness to God's world. After all, that's what God did for us. That's what this Christmas story is all about. God coming in Jesus to bring wholeness to our world. What happens to our faith when we manage our space so that there is not room for God and no extra time to act on his behalf? Space, time, Sometimes it's as simple as personal preference. One pastor received a call from a young woman asking if he would preside at her wedding at a nearby hotel on a future Sunday at 10 a.m. You're as shocked as he was. He was speechless. She asked, because there was silence, he said, is there some problem? The pastor found his voice finally and said that he had one or two other commitments on Sunday mornings at 10 o'clock. But maybe she could try the Seventh-day Adventist church. <laughs> That's a rather extreme and kind of humorous example, but there are, time, are there times when per, our personal preferences in life, our lifestyles, the things we like to do, cut us off from God and his work and his world? When we do manage to cut ourselves off from God by space pressures, by time pressures, by personal preference, by many other kinds of pressures that could be real or imagined, these pressures can potentially overtake and overwhelm what we want to become as Christ followers. And when that happens for too long, even in the best and easiest of circumstances, though we may not immediately realize it, we may eventually find ourselves in a spiritual wilderness. But even then, God can use those times in our life. Christmas shows that when life became oppressive, when darkness seeks to capture our souls, he comes to gather, to save, to heal, to restore his people, his family, toward real community again. Isaiah shares the dream of spiritual and national renewal in chapter 35. It sounds like this. The desert and the parched land will be glad. The wilderness will rejoice and burst into bloom. It will rejoice greatly and shout for joy. They will see glory, the glorious splendor of the Lord. So strengthen the feeble hands and steady the weak knees. Say to the fearful, be strong and do not fear. Your God will come to you. The blind will see, the deaf will hear, the lame will leap, and the speechless will shout for joy. Everything that was barren will become lush. As God returns and restores his people, they will gladly sing and be overwhelmed with joy. So in our journalist's African wilderness of chaos, one of the women living next door became a best friend. When dust storms came, they would put a candle on the wall to share the light. I don't know how that works in a dust storm. I'm just reading the story. But apparently, they figured out some way to do that, to make it work. She would make American food and pass it over to the tea shop customers who tried to identify and swallow the strange things that she was making. Each night, as they hung their rope beds, they would whisper over the wall and wish blessings for the next day. The neighbor made her a part of the family and called her sister. May it be that we too can be more and more family as we journey together on this road with Jesus Christ into our future and ultimately to heaven. Jesus promises that if we make room in our hearts for him, someday he will make room for us in heaven by his side. And until that day, he is always with us in our hearts. If that is your hope, to follow his call, to embrace his values, to desire and work for Christ, for hope, for peace, for joy, 
for love in the hearts of people everywhere, then he invites us to his covenant in communion. And you can feel free to participate. If you didn't get a goblet when you came in, raise your hand. The ushers can get one to you. Anybody raise it high? I'm not seeing anybody, so I think we're okay. We've heard tonight from Philippians about his creation and through his work on the cross, the availability of recreation and the vision for a brighter future for which all the nations hope. We're going to sing, O Come All Ye Faithful, as our invitation to worship Christ, the newborn King, through communion. So let's sing, O Come All Ye Faithful. Lord, we confess that too often, much like early Bethlehem, if we find room for you at all, it's in some insignificant corner of our heart, a black back shed, that we hope will not do too much to disrupt living our life the way we want to live it. We use the excuse that there is not enough room for you and there is plenty of space, yet you still come to us where we are, like the shepherds who discovered your message while busy on the job. We make the excuse that we do not have enough time for you when there is plenty. For it seems like when we carve out that time for you, the rest of the important things of the day just seem to fall into place and happen so much more effectively. We make many and varied excuses, but ultimately we must recognize that we fear letting you in lest our personal preferences get lost. And when we follow our excuses, We find we are living in a wilderness of our own making. Life doesn't work like we hope it could or should. Awaken us, Lord, to the fact that you are not bound by space or time, and especially that when we are stripped down to the essence of our life, your preference for us is not to live in barren emptiness, but to emerge in a blooming, flourishing garden, Garden of Eden, where the tree of life is fed by streams of living water, 
and there is nothing but healing and encouragement. So we receive your gracious life as we all make room and time for your pleasure in our life, where you offer us peace through your gentle mercy. Through the birth and death and resurrection of Christ, you reconcile us sinners to you. And so on this communion Christmas Eve night, we bask in your peace and light and life and healing that you bring, that even we can be born again because you were born to us. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray this. Amen. Let's sing our gratitude for his gracious forgiveness as expressed in the hymn, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Let's stand as we sing this. They found no room, and Jesus was born in the poverty of a stable. And then as a man, Jesus traveled from Galilee to Jerusalem and again found no room for his reign, much less his ideas, and he died despised and rejected. But through that suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin's power and eternal death, and made with us a new covenant by water and by the Spirit. So pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and at home and on these gifts of bread and cup. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with each other, one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. And as God's children, then, let's pray with meaning the prayer that he taught us to pray. Our Father 
who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And in saying the prayer, we are committing ourselves to living out its values, to do your will, to seek, to receive and grant forgiveness, to resist temptation and refuse to do evil, and enabled by the Holy Spirit through the light of Christ to bring glory to God and his kingdom. And as you have offered yourself to us through your birth, through your death and resurrection, and through these communion elements, so we in turn, as a reasonable worship, offer ourselves as holy and living sacrifices, united together to answer the call to be the city on the hill, the light on the stand that fills the room and moves out into the world. Through these elements, then, we receive your light so that we may be light. As your word became flesh, born of woman on that night long ago, so on that night in which he gave himself up for us, he took the bread. He gave thanks to you, and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, This is my body, which is broken for you. As often as you eat it, eat it in remembrance of me. Take and eat. After they finished the supper, he took the cup, Jesus took the cup, lifted it up, and gave thanks. And he offered it to his disciples, saying, This is the blood of the new covenant, my blood which is poured out for the forgiveness of your sins and the sins of many. As often as you drink it, drink it in remembrance of me. Take and drink. Now, friends, as you have been light, continue to work out the application of the saved life with great care and reverence to God, for it is he who works in you to fulfill his good purposes. Do this without grumbling or complaining or arguing, so that as a pure child of God, your light will stand out even brighter against this dark and corrupt world. If you hold firmly to the word of life, you will shine among them like stars in the deep night sky. We do that best when first we respond to the invitation to come to the manger and adore his light. And second, when we take the space and time at the manger to silently behold who he is, our glorious Lord and Savior, love's pure light. And finally, as we continue more and more to shine more brightly, to usher in his peace. So let's sing as we spread the light through the sanctuary and symbolically wherever we go in the world.
we prepare to leave the sanctuary in silence this night, remember that you are people who have made the space and taken the time and desire to see a great light. Therefore, you are people who have received the ultimate gift, the Son of God, the light of the world. Be bearers then of his light, going with the blessing of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit this night and always.